Australia has a number of extensive forest regions, but it has in total less forest area than most countries of comparable size. Being situated mainly in a low and spasmodic rainfall belt, Australia's great forests have developed only in the coastal regions, the mountain ash in Victoria and Tasmania, and the carry in Western Australia. Growing as high as 280 feet and measuring up to 34 feet around the trunk, the carry is one of the world's largest trees, ranking with the mountain ash only second to the redwoods of California. The carry forest in the southwest portion of Western Australia covers some third of a million acres and has become a major economic asset to the state. The whole of the forest is under the control of the Forests Department of Western Australia. For the purposes of administration, the Cary Forest is divided into three areas, each area under the control of a divisional forest officer. The Pemberton Division, the heart of the Cary Forest, is controlled by divisional forest officer Pat McNamara, who until ten years ago was the forest officer of Sherwood Forest in England, the home of the legendary Robin Hood. Since joining the West Australian Forest Department, Mr McNamara has worked in many parts of Australia's largest state, but has, since 1958, been located at Pemberton. An outstanding expert in his field, Mr McNamara has spent his entire working life in and around great forests. Yes, well, great forests are not quite so plentiful as you might imagine. In fact, there are only few forests with tall timbers like the Californian Redwood, the Victorian Ash, and our own West Australian Cary. Now, there's a number of reasons for this. The first, the species. Not all trees have the ability to reach giant proportions. Then there's the site. Soil and water conditions have to be right to support the growth of these giant stands. And lastly, there's age. It takes a long time for a tree to reach these giant proportions and, as a matter of fact, carry is one of the faster growing eucalypts, but even so, it will take 120 years for the average tree to reach a girth of 14 to 15 feet. That's measured around the circumference at ground level. Whilst a lot of these giants we see in the forest today will have taken 400 years to reach their present size. Our carry forests are managed so as to provide a continuous and increasing supply of raw material for the timber industry, which employs some six and a half thousand wage earners and has established over 130 sawmills together with several complete townships in the southwest. All major sawmilling, sawmilling operations are carried out on a sustained yield basis with the objective of providing each sawmill and the township and community dependent upon it for a large portion of its livelihood with continuous life. This is particularly important in the far south where there are several towns which depend entirely on sawmilling for their livelihood. Now Pemberton is the main town in my division and in the forest nearby, a youth camp has been established where parties of schoolchildren come each year to spend a week or a fortnight holidaying in the forest atmosphere. Many of these groups are from individual city or inland schools and the children are always accompanied by one or two teachers. Groups are usually about 40 strong and an average of 500 or so stay at the camp each year. <laughs> Pemberton Township was established about 50 years ago, more or less simultaneously with the introduction of the first timber mills in the district. Today, apart from being the main town in my district, it is one of the main timber towns in the southwest of the state and is the centre of a prosperous agricultural area. The children from the youth camp soon find that Pemberton can provide all the needs of modern civilization. 
region of Western Australia, which is the home of the Cary Forest, has always been famous for its wildfires. It is the oldest part of the Australian continent, and many of the original primitive species of wildflowers have remained to the present day and exist only in this area. The forest, with its moist environment, is even more heavily flowered than the surrounding districts. In late winter and spring, Carpets of colour lie beneath the giant carries. Altogether, there are about 6,000 species of wildflowers in the southwest, which makes this region one of the outstanding wildflower gardens of the world. With school groups, a study of the forest flowers is always part of the Kemp curriculum. At least 50 inches of rain falls in the Cary Forest each year, most of it during the winter months. This tree, now a handy storm shelter for the children, has been hollowed out by repeated fires. Although still growing, the most useful part of the tree has been destroyed and its value greatly reduced. There are many trees like this in the forest, but with present day management and fire control, we have reduced the chances of this sort of damage in future. Most of the rain which falls in the forest region feeds off into brooks or rivers which run southwards to the sea. Many of these streams are fast running with rapids and cascades and make an ideal home for brown and rainbow trout which have been introduced in recent years. The trout have prospered in their new home as the streams are permanent even in the hottest summer months. The wildlife of the forest, not so readily obvious as the flora, is nevertheless varied and interesting. After the share, the students find many unusual animals. The long-necked turtle, which inhabits most of the lakes and pools, takes the opportunity, after the heavy rains, to change his domicile. Wildlife is never ending. Lizards in all shapes and sizes rely on their fearful looks for protection, a reliance which is often misplaced when young boys are about.
there seem to be almost as many variety of birds in the forest as there are wildflowers. The kookaburra is one species which is not native to Western Australia, but has become plentiful on being introduced from the east. Other varieties include many local native birds, which are found only in the southwest region. An experimental trout hatchery was established near Pemberton in 1927. Tests were so successful that a new and larger hatchery was later established, and this today helps to stock dams and streams throughout the state. Brown and rainbow trout are found in quantity in all the streams in the forest area. How long are they kept in the pool? They are kept three to four years until they are mature. The eggs are then stripped or gently pressed out of the female into a bowl. How many eggs does a trout lay? About a thousand. I wish our chooks would lie that many. <laughs> the forest streams are now considered to be the outstanding trout streams of the state. Not only trout swim in the forest pools, however. The youth camp students take advantage of a nearby stream, which, with the voluntary effort on the part of the Pemberton townspeople, has been transformed into a first-class swimming pool. Townspeople, visitors, tourists, all appreciate the pool in the hot summer months. which visit the forest, particularly the school children, spend a good deal of their time under the tuition of the local school headmaster, Mr. Down, studying the forest and its many attractions. Usually the children, either from the city or inland country areas, are fascinated and overawed by the great size and immensity of the forest around them. Gee, it must be the biggest tree in the world. Not quite, Johnny, but nearly. The Californian redwood is bigger. I think it's the most beautiful tree. Yes, it is a lovely tree. Its proper name is Eucalyptus diversicolor. But we use its Aboriginal name, Carrie. How old is it, sir? Well, it depends upon the size. This one is over 200 feet high, and that makes it a very old tree. You can say that it was already growing when Columbus discovered America. How much timber can we get out of it? Probably about 35 loads. Enough to build seven complete houses. Seven houses out of one tree? In summer, the carry sheds its bark. Large strips peel off and fall to the ground, often adding to the fire risk. Without the old bark, the smooth trunk at times is mottled with splashes of gold and silver. There are still things we don't quite understand about the carry, such as the cause of the excrescences occasionally found on the trunk. No other tree in the world can supply up to 50 feet length of 16 by 16 timber free of heartwood. This tree is still alive. From the severed trunk, new limbs have shot up. At times, the forest department burns the ground under the trees to encourage germination. Do carries grow from seeds? Yes. The seed of a carry is smaller than the lettuce seed. It takes a quarter of a million seeds to make one pound in weight. Here is a young shoot which is doing pretty well. That one is four feet high and about two years old. It is really amazing how these young trees will one day grow into giants. 
carry flowers only every four or five years. Bud development may take up to three years. After flowering, the capsules ripen and the seeds mature after 12 to 15 months. You can tell when there's blossom on the bough by the screeching of the parakeets, which are attracted by the flowers and swarm about in thousands. The blossom supplies the beekeeper with a real honey harvest. Sometimes wild bees, too, are found in the crevices in the trees. What other trees are in the forest? There's Jarrah. The timber's equally valuable, but the trunk is not usually as straight as the carry and the bark is not as smooth. What about the red gum? At present, the red gum is of no commercial value, although it may eventually become valuable for wood pulp. Incidentally, the red gum derives its name from the resin which oozes through the bark. Will all these lovely trees be cut down, sir? No, the forest will not be cut down, only the old and unhealthy trees. The young trees are left to mature. In fact, the forest department surveys the forest and marks those trees which can be taken, like that one over there. A good faller can drop the largest tree in less than 20 minutes. The forester marks the direction of fall, as well as the tree to be cut, and the carry fallers can place the tree within inches of the marked position, a skill which is necessary to avoid damage to the tree and to standing timber. The faller must select an escape route in case of danger and be constantly alert for falling limbs, or widow makers, as they are called in the forest. After allowing a safe interval, the faller moves along the tree, selects the length of his logs, and then cuts them to size for hauling to the bush landing. The bullock teams, with the cracking whips and colourful language of the drivers, have been replaced by giant bulldozers and logging arches, which are used to raise the leading end of the logs and haul them along snig tracks to carefully selected bush landings for loading onto the mill railway. Single carry logs may weigh as much as 30 tonnes and powerful motor winches and heavy wire ropes are needed to roll them onto the railway wagons where they are carefully positioned to avoid mishaps on the 16 mile trip to the sawmill. railway, or rake as we call it, has hauled almost a quarter of a million logs, as well as many passengers, to the mill. But as operations move to more distant areas, it will shortly be replaced by heavy motor trucks and jinkers, bringing the age of steam haulage to a close. passes through some of the most picturesque country in the Cary Forest. Crossing the Warren River and climbing out of the gorge, the firemen require some assistance to feed the hungry firebox.
are rolled off the trucks, measured and cut to length with a steam cross cut. They are then winched onto the mill trolley and pulled into the mill where they are carefully set up on the traveller before passing through the giant twin circular saws for the first stage of conversion into sawn timber. Seven thousand cubic feet, that is over two hundred tons of timber, pass through the mill each day. The circular saws, six feet in diameter with needle sharp teeth, travel at thousands of feet a second as they slice through one of the hardest and toughest timbers in the world. The saws must be replaced at least twice a day for sharpening and maintenance. Leaving the sawmill, the timber is sorted, inspected and bundled to supply the demands of home and overseas markets in such widely separated countries as New Zealand, the United Kingdom, Germany and South Africa. From Aboriginal times, fire has always been present in the forest. But whereas the natives fired the forest under cool conditions to encourage fresh pasture for game, serious fires accompanied the arrival of the white men. Fire protection is one of the most important activities of the forester and immediate detection of fires is imperative. Gloucester Tree is the tallest of four similar lookout towers in the Pemberton Division. It was constructed in 1947 and has been continuously manned during the summer months ever since. The lookout is perched some 200 feet above ground level, but a good man can climb it in a minute and a half. Over 2,000 visitors climb the tree each year and the tree itself is one of the major attractions of the Pemberton district. constant watch for the first signs of smoke. As soon as a smoke is detected, he reports its position by telephone to headquarters, where it is verified by other lookouts, and firefighting gangs are immediately contacted by radio and dispatched to the scene of the fire. Constant vigilance and alert well-trained gangs are required for efficient fire suppression. The cooperation of local residents and visitors alike is essential in keeping the forest free from fires. Fire prevention is just as important as fire suppression and each year during the cooler weather of spring and autumn fire breaks are burnt under carefully controlled conditions to reduce accumulated fuel 
on areas close to settlements and on strategic belts throughout the forest. The Gloucester tree, an example of the carry at its best, is, like the other giants of the forest, more than 400 years old. We do not know how long the forest itself has been in existence, but we do know that with present care and management, it will remain as an Australian landmark for centuries to come. Future generations will benefit from today's good husbandry. They will inherit, as a national asset, the Cary Forests of Western Australia, one of the great forests of the world. <laughs>